Let me double check to make sure all of my settings are correct. All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I just have to make sure I selected the right mic because I, I would say at least like two or three episodes a year, I don't select the right microphone and then my sound quality is terrible. I think the week I moved into this, my new, my new place in St. Paul, Minneapolis, I sounded like I was screaming in the microphone. I never apologized to everyone because I re-listened to that audio and it was terrible. Um, so anyway, this is Melanie, by the way, co-host of Red Power Hour, um, calling in from Mini Shota Mokoche, um, otherwise known as St. Paul, uh, Minneapolis, the Twin Cities. And yeah, it's like totally fall here. Um, I turned my heater on for the first time today. Um, I have a sweatshirt, so it's a little bit chilly. It's overcast too. But how's it over uh, in your neck of the woods, Elena? It is actually pretty warm. I mean, I have noticed the change gradually in the last two weeks. The evenings are definitely cooler, but mm -hmm. the and the mornings are cooler, but we're we're not going to break 80 anymore and and that's that's actually a good thing same fall is yeah. fall is definitely here last time we talked about like the green chili which is our um it, that's our harbinger of of fall um green chili season's going does it still s it's going to be it's going it's going it's going to be over soon still yeah like uh -huh. by next weekend we're probably going to be seeing the last of the chili crop and so harvest festivals all over and um, just mm -hmm. super grateful. I'm going up to Taos on the 30th um, for their uh, autumnal uh, feast. And it's mm. been three years. So this is huge. Wow. Um, really grateful for that. And that we've actually, speaking of water, we've had rain pretty consistently since mid-July, which, wow, really? which is amazing. That's different that's very unique given i think the last few years it is and it feels like the monsoons which usually come in july and august are now august and september and i don't know i mean i'm grateful for any moisture that we get i don't know if that shift to later in the year um is is a result of of just it's just too hot in july for it to rain mm -hmm. like climate change so we're seeing the shift mm -hmm. which which means we have very little we have very little fall, like there's no precursor to fall. It's 80 degrees and then mm. it's fall. Anyway, this is Elena. Yeah, uh... Oh, <laughs> I started. I thought you already said your name. I just started talking <laughs> and I did not say I'm calling in from Ogapoge, otherwise known as Santa Fe. And I was talking about green chili and, and water and fall. So, <laughs> I mean, those are all things that are important to talk about. Uh, I mean, right, you were talking, like, so today we're going to be talking about water. There's a lot of stuff going on with water, um, whether it's environmental racism and toxic water supplies in places like Chicago and Jackson, whether it's uh, the lack of water because of drought in places like the Southwest along the Colorado River, um, typhoons and hurricanes continuing to devastate communities um, in Puerto Rico and Alaska. So... We're just going to talk about water. I feel like it's going to be a very somber conversation. Sometimes I think on Red Power Hour, we try to be kind of like quippy, you know, um, with our freestyle. But I feel like this uh, this conversation isn't going to be quite as fun because <laughs> it's uh, not it's it's a it's bad. It's just real bad. Um, so, yeah, we, we just thought that it was time to revisit this topic. And it's perfect for fall right as we enter into um, we transition into winter and you said that there's all sorts of harvest festivals. There's feast days happening in New Mexico right now. Like you can go up to Taos for one and harvesting, right? And traditional indigenous agriculture is obviously tied to the health and the well-being of water sources um, all over Turtle Island, um, but certainly in the Southwest. So that also relates. Uh, we're going to talk about a few different topics today, but I compiled a massive amount of information uh, regarding the Colorado River. And I started researching tribal water rights, um, but then also the relationship of kind of tribal sovereignty to the Colorado River 10 years ago, 10 and a half years ago, 
when the Navajo Nation, which is my indigenous nation, um, was trying to negotiate a settlement, a water settlement, um, regarding the lower Colorado River, which is a tributary um, and of the, the, the larger Colorado River. And uh, at that time, there was sort of a popular uprising in the Navajo Nation from just everyday Navajo people who felt that the settlement and the terms of the settlement were really fleecing Navajo people, um, that there wasn't enough money being provided for the infrastructure projects that are needed and that are still needed a decade later and have not been built, <laughs> you know, to deliver clean water to um, a number of Navajo homes. 40% um, of Navajo people who live in the Navajo Nation still don't have running water. So just to give folks um, a reminder about that, we've talked about it before in relationship to COVID-19, right, and the need for running water and sanitary water delivery um, to decrease those numbers at the height of the pandemic. Um, and so there was this popular uprising and the settlement, the Navajo Nation Tribal Council at that time rejected that settlement. Um, because there was such a large public outcry and they were pressured basically to reject the terms of the settlement and go back to the negotiating table. Now, the lawyers, oh man, the law lawyers, lawyers in tribal politics are parasites. There's so many lawyers, um, many of whom are non-native. They make hundreds of millions of dollars um, off of perfecting, you know, perfecting like the complex and intricate like legal world of tribes <laughs> and then tribes have to negotiate like you have to negotiate absolutely everything um in the lives of native people has to go through the law like our lives are so heavily adjudicated i'm not sure if there's other people who are as deeply impacted by the law as native people are on a regular and on a daily basis um, and this includes tribal nations and the water is no different. It's incredibly complicated. Every time I try to present on this, people's heads are just spinning because they're like, wait, what? Who are you talking about? What is this like Supreme Court decision that you're talking about? I don't understand the language that you're using like this, this and this. And so I wrote this thing in 2012 in um, support of like the public outcry against this water settlement of, where I was trying to talk about how if you just look at the history of water policy, specifically through case law in the state of Arizona and in the broader region of the Southwest related to the Colorado River, um, what you'll see is just a pattern of continued diminishment of tribal sovereignty, which essentially means tribal nations, even though um, tribal nations have first priority rights, senior water rights, um, two bodies of water, um, both above ground and below ground, like the Colorado River, which is considered a surface water um, source, uh, it's called the Winter's Doctrine. This was decided in a Supreme Court decision um, in 1908. Uh, even though tribes have priority um, senior water rights, the settlement process, which has become very popular in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century, trumps the senior water rights. Because essentially what happened, because this is how colonialism works, is that the mega development of um, cities like Phoenix settlements, um, settler settlements like Phoenix, Las Vegas, Los Angeles, of course, they didn't care whether or not tribes had senior water rights. They were just greedily trying to develop and make billions of dollars off of real estate um, and land grabs, um, as well as industrial agriculture, like the Imperial um, uh, the Imperial Valley District. Wait, Imperial Irrigation District um, in Central California, um, as well as the Central Arizona Project, which feeds a lot of industrial agriculture in Southern Arizona. Right, so the, the needs of capitalism, right, and the profit of the ruling class um, in the post-war period obviously trumped um, any type of winter's doctrine rights that tribes had. And so here we are, you know what, Phoenix's boom was in the 60s, so we're like 60 years later, we're 50, 60 years later, and being confronted with the greatest water crisis in the region uh, since kind of modernity. <laughs> Essentially, um, and there is the the Bureau of Reclamation, which is like a purely colonial entity, if ever there was one, um, has absolutely participated in the displacement of Native people, the destruction of Native homelands and fertile bottomlands in a place like the Missouri River Basin, for example, with Ochati Shakoi people. Um, but the Bureau of Reclamation has basically laid down this gauntlet for all of the the, the states, the tribes 
and the parties like private corporations um, that own industrial agriculture. Um, they're like, you have to reduce your water usage by 15% by like next year. It's September of 2022. So next year is in like three months. <laughs> And that Lake Powell and Lake Mead, which are the two largest reservoirs in the entire country, um, basically there's, Elaine and I were talking earlier, like when I was growing up um, and like all the working class kids I went to high school with in Colorado, they would go on vacations to Lake Powell and rent houseboats. And for them, Lake Powell was just kind of like a place to go to relax and like, I don't know, their parents would just get drunk on a houseboat and everyone, you know, they would just like go swimming in the lake and they would do this for a week and then they'd come back and then everyone would resume life or whatever. But actually Lake Powell and Lake Mead were constructed as storage containers, essentially, um, for the water usage further down in what's considered the lower Colorado River Basin. Um, and so Lake Powell and Lake Mead are at historic lows and they actually haven't, Lake Mead hasn't been full apparently since 1986. So what's 86, 96, 2006, it's been almost 30 years of writing on the wall, right? In terms of like, we actually need to do something about the overconsumption of water because there isn't enough water for like how much people are using. Um, and so of course, who's using that water? It's the ruling class that's using that water. Yes, it's like settlers in large cities, places like Phoenix and LA, but primarily it's the private corporations that build real estate developments, that build golf courses, and that own the means of production, i.e. industrial food production in places like Arizona and California. Las Vegas also uses a lot of water because it's in the fucking desert. <laughs> like, and so is Phoenix. And so it's basically, Cap the capitalist class is just just sucking up all the water and has been for decades and has created a situation right where not only has the sovereignty and the senior water rights of tribes been completely destroyed i mean it's really easy to see how completely destroyed those things have been by just capitalist greed in this region, but you can see this so clearly through the history of water. And so now tribes are like, okay, the only way we're actually going to get wet water. So people talk about water in relationship to wet water versus paper water and winter's doctrine rights are paper water because they're, they don't actually apply anymore because settler colonialism and capitalist infrastructure has so thoroughly devastated the entire region that we actually can't go back to like a winter's rights approach. And so tribes basically now just have to settle us a mere fraction of the amount of water they're actually entitled to. And through the process of settlement, then they're promised a certain amount of money for infrastructure, i.e. like water delivery projects. So Navajo Nation is still settling um, the 2012 uh, settlement that I was talking about where there's an uprising in, and the Navajo Nation Tribal Council rejected it at the time. But I think um, only maybe 40, I forgot what it was. It was like 40 or 50% of the indigenous nations in Arizona have settled their water rights and the rest are still in litigation and still trying to figure out how to do that. But basically tribes don't even get any money, even though the fucking federal government has a trust obligation to provide this funding because reservations are federal trust lands. This is a very specific aspect of federal Indian policy and federal Indian law. But Congress basically holds up trust money to create the infrastructure to deliver water to those 40% <laughs> of homes in the Navajo Nation that don't have running water. But, but it doesn't because it's like, you got to settle your water rights. And why is it like that? Well, it's because the government and then these multinational corporations that give like fucking super PACs to all these members of Congress and these politicians are like, you can't let those tribes try to litigate their senior water rights through the Winters Doctrine, because what if they do that? Then they're going to have way too many rights to too much water, and then we won't have enough water to make the billion-dollar profit that we want to make off of, I don't know, fucking growing almonds <laughs> in California to feed, like, I don't know, the New Age health craze around almonds um, that has sprouted up in this country over the last 15 years. So this is basically the situation. It's a crash wave. It's crash course. It's a crass crash course in what the situation looks like. But I don't know if folks have been paying attention over the last year, but especially in the last month and a half. But like there has been a ton of press around the Colorado River 
and how bad it is, right? So Lake Powell and Lake Mead are part of the Colorado River. So the Colorado River has an upper basin and a lower basin. And so the upper basin, of course, drains, it goes south, southerly, and then part of the water that's supposed to be flowing through the river gets stopped in the reservoirs in Lake Powell and Lake Mead. And then a certain amount of water gets to continue to flow. But all of that water is used by like thousands of different parties that are parties to all of these settlements, tribes, states, private corporations, farmers, like there's all of these different entities that have rights to water. And it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated process to parse out, you know, the, the amount of water each of these parties is allowed to use. Um, and so Lake Powell and Lake Mead, um, the majority of that water, my understanding, goes to the industrial agriculture in California um, and in Arizona. And so right now, the Bureau of Reclamation, which you know handles water on behalf of the United States government as part of the Department of the Interior, um, has really just laid down this kind of deadline for all of the users, but they're targeting primarily industrial agriculture in uh, California and Arizona because those obviously are the, the parties that use most of the water that's stored in these reservoirs. And they're like, if you don't reduce this by 15% next year, like Lake Powell is gonna cease to exist. <laughs> like, I don't know, I forgot what the time frame was, but it's a matter of like two or three years or something like that. Um, and so it's hard. I know this is all very technical. I've been talking nonstop for like 15 minutes now about this, but it's, I cannot overstate how dire <laughs> the situation is. 40 million people depend upon the Colorado River for water. Um, and it is, it's hard to describe the insult that native people and native nations have to continue to face where it's like, not only did your greedy, grubby motherfucking settler hands overdevelop this region? You just ransacked it and you knew it wasn't going to be sustainable. And then you did this and you continued to deny us our senior rights to this water. But then you siphoned energy through coal production which needs a lot of water out of our communities, which then gave us cancer, right? In order to feed your greed. And now you're telling us the only way we're allowed to have a meager amount of water. I'm just talking from a Navajo Nation perspective is if we go through this multi-million dollar process, we as nations have to spend millions and millions and millions of dollars on these fucking lawyers to litigate these settlements where we get a mere fraction of what we're actually entitled to. Because let me tell you, if tribes actually had, if we could actually invoke and develop a form of tribal sovereignty that was premised on the enforcement of Winter's Doctrine rights, guarantee you we would not be in this situation because tribes would have already understood and figured out a way to protect, to protect, conserve, and steward the Colorado River, which is sacred, by the way, to literally all of the tribal nations that lie along it would have figured out a way to steward that shit in a way where we would actually have water for everybody. In the Red Deal, when we say that indigenous liberation is for everyone, this is one of those situations in which if tribal nations actually had the amount of control over the amount of water that they're supposed to be guaranteed through the Winters Doctrine, like it would benefit everyone. But instead, of course, right, capitalism wins the day and settler colonialism wins the day and we become resource colonies for outside development. And so then on top of all of that insult, it's now Native nations who are party to the Colorado River are being asked the audacity of asking these Native nations to donate some of their water, the ones who've settled their water, their water rights, to donate water so that the rest of the entire region can just like live and survive and even that is just a stopgap measure. And some of them have. I think that the Gila River community has donated like 100,000 acre feet of water to Lake Mead, maybe Lake Mead or Lake Powell, to make sure that there's enough supply. But like even the 15% reduction 
um, that's being asked by 2023 is a stopgap measure because there's no like, there's absolutely no plan in place for like how the entire region is going to continue to exist with the projections of the steadily decreasing amount of wet water that is available because of climate change, right? Of course, because of climate change. And it wasn't even until recently, I think it was like 2019, when tribes were even allowed to be part of the conversations about how the Colorado River would be managed to address drought. As recently as 2007, when there was the, the, the most recent management plan for the Colorado River, tribes weren't even allowed to be at the table. And it's like, you've literally kept Native nations out of these conversations a hundred years after the Winter's Doctrine was established, and you used up all the fucking water, and you've turned this into a crisis for everyone. And like, if you had just listened to Native nations back at the beginning, or even at any point prior to 2019, you probably wouldn't be in this situation. And the same goes with fire management, actually. Um, the U.S. Department of... Um, forestry like has also done a terrible job managing fires in the west and tribal nations have entire fire management programs that are based on traditional ecological knowledge and indigenous knowledge of the ecosystem that are far superior i mean really frankly proven empirically to be far superior to the way the department of the interior manages the land and the water and so I know I'm on my soapbox and I'm going on about this because I've been like following this and studying this for 10 years and it just pisses me off so much, but that really is the picture. And so it's like, what, that ship sailed. This is like a cake that can't be unbaked, essentially, with the Colorado River. Like, you throw it in tribes in 2019 and being like, hey guys, why don't you help us save the day? That's, that, that's not gonna happen. Really, the writing is on the wall that there's less water, there's going to be increasingly less water. And unless people simply stop using so much water, we're screwed <laughs> in this region. And that is the reality. And so it's like, whether or not people and by people, I mean, rich settlers <laughs> are willing to like put the, I don't know, you know, just like the basic survival of the land or like the future or just like people before their money grabbing, you know, needs for profit, which they're not going to do, like, it's not going to change because they're the ones who are using the most water. And in fact, the private corporations, the mega corporations that own the industrial agriculture businesses that are using most of the water in California and Arizona, they're making the U.S. government compensate them for every acre foot of water that they're going to decrease to, to meet this this goal of a 15% reduction. And it's like billions and billions of dollars. Where's that money coming from? Is it coming from us? Am I paying taxes <laughs> to bail out at these mega corporations? Like, it's just, it's mind boggling. It's like, I, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know if I have a political analysis about it, except like, we just need some working class solidarity and there needs to be like organizing, not just for indigenous nations, but like there needs to be organizing across the board in this entire region to push back against these corporations because they're, they're literally, they're just stealing our future. <laughs> and they have been for decades without any checks whatsoever from the government and, and now they want us to bail them out with billions of dollars I, you know, there's no consequences. There's no consequences for, for the theft. So it doesn't just happen with land. It also happens with water. And I think that's an incredible, it's incredibly stark in the Southwest. I mean, I keep saying here, but I don't live in the Southwest anymore, but you know, my nation is from the Southwest, that's my home. And so this is why I'm so passionate and fired up about it. I think Nicole Horseherder, who is a prominent kind of water advocate and an activist in Navajo Nation, um, who lives up on Black Mesa, Nicole Horseherder said, you know, the Indian Wars didn't end, you know, in the 19th century, they just changed. And now it's like water, water is the primary way in which dispossession, the dispossession of indigenous sovereignty, power, um, and autonomy is occurring. And it's incredibly important for people to understand 
that this complex um, kind of picture around water really is like the modern day Indian wars. And it's the modern, it's the way that possess, dispossession is happening primarily. That, and I would say like incarceration and carcerality. And I, I don't know what that means in terms of activism or organizing, but like I said, there needs to be some sort of class-based struggle against these ruling class fucks <laughs> who have stolen our future because of this. 40 million people, 40 million people. And I think it's it's important to look also at like first of all that was an amazing analysis so thank you for that like I I look at the Colorado River Basin and um, and just from a historical context who lived there prior to colonization where did they live. Um, what were their livelihoods? Were they farmers? Where did they farm? Nobody, no indigenous people lived in fucking Phoenix or the area that Phoenix now occupies. Why? Two reasons. It's too fucking hot and there's no water. So where did settlers decide to settle in the 1960s when it was too cold for them in other parts of Turtle Island that they stole? They decided to have second homes in Phoenix so that they could escape wherever they were doing their dastardly deeds and it was too cold in the winter. So they settled in, in places like Phoenix that were going to require a huge amount of water infrastructure to sustain. And because they're white settlers and entitled Karens and Chads, they had to have golf courses to amuse themselves in the winter. So they built what? They built giant oceans of Kentucky bluegrass, which requires more water than any other type of grass to sustain. And they built them all around Phoenix so that they could recreate. Now you compare that to 40% of the people living on the Navajo Nation who don't have running water. And what's wrong with that picture, right? So our ancestors didn't live in these places because they were not livable. And look at Las Vegas, Nevada, same thing, except instead of snowbirds, white settler snowbirds, who needed a place to escape the cold, you've got people, um, you've got this entire community that rose up based, again, on recreation, but this time on gambling and prostitution and drinking and and another place that our ancestors' relatives did not occupy. They occupied areas around there, but they didn't live right there. Why? There's no water. Life was not sustainable. So all of these places that were built that are sucking the water out of the Colorado, um, not only are they sucking the water, they always have sucked the water out of the Colorado, but these dams that they built, which destroyed entire ecosystems with these dams, um, are, are now drying up. And it's, you know, if, if Lake Mead drops 32 more feet, that hydroelectric plant, which which um, supplies energy to New Mexico, Colorado, Nevada, California, will simply stop working. So their whole house of cards um, is beginning to fall down. And had they simply followed indigenous um, leadership, had they sought out indigenous council or indigenous leadership, or even just fucking looked at where we lived and what we did and how we sustained life, we wouldn't be in this predicament. And it's climate change. And yeah, I'm going to say it, climate change is squarely on the back of the imperialist, capitalist, and settler colonial nations. And we're having to pay the price 
for these poor decisions that they made. And every single step of the way, every single one of those decisions was poor. And the Colorado River is much bigger, has much more reach, has many more people living around it. But in a small way, what mirrors what's going on with the Colorado River in New Mexico here with the Rio Grande, the Rio Grande ran dry south of Albuquerque for the first time in my lifetime. There was no water south of Albuquerque. And that, you talk about a harbinger of things to come, like that's the life way of our people. And all up and down from the northern boundary, uh, so-called Colorado, um, where the water, where the uh, headwaters of the Rio Grande are all the way down um, to where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. That's where all of my ancestors settled because it was the main source of water, the only source of water in New Mexico. And that was what we farmed from. The fact that it ran dry is frightening. It's frightening. And, and I can't even imagine um, what people who, who depend, and I'm talking to indigenous people because I don't care about settlers, but what indigenous people are feeling looking at having to settle their water rights for what is in existence now versus what was 20, 30 years ago. It's, it's appalling and it's scary. I, house of cards, that's a really good way to describe, um, just the, the approach to water particularly in that region and right it's just a paper tiger and even now even now when it's like obvious there's literally no water like i think i went to las vegas for a conference three years ago this was before covid it was the fall of 2019 yep yeah. and drove from albuquerque to vegas and you cross over lake mead i believe when you're driving um in that direction towards vegas and it was already just half empty. It was half it. This was three years ago. And I was like, damn, <laughs> this is bad. Like, this is not going to get replenished because I'd already been doing work on, like, the history of the Colorado River, scientifically, legally, um, politically, um, culturally. And so I was like, this ain't going to get any better. And it didn't, right? <laughs> three years later, and it's way worse um, in both Lake Mead and Lake Powell. And so... It's I like I said today was not going to be an uplifting day because COVID, right? Talking about harbingers of what's to come, the way that COVID has been handled is a really good indicator of how drought is being handled and will be handled. Right? I just said that the burden of responsibility for the drought lies on the shoulders of the wealthiest in, in the region of the Southwest, the wealthiest parties to the Colorado River. They're asking Congress to bail them out with billions of dollars, right, to make up for the loss in actual water that they're going to be able to use for their operations or their lawns or whatever the fuck they do, building their mega developments. And at the same time, right, they... That's only a stopgap measure, like I said. Um, not too many, two or three more years down the road. There can't continue to be financial bailouts. They're literally going to just have to stop using so much water. 15% is going to become 20%. 20% is going to become 25%, right? They're literally just going to have to shut down some of their operations, and cities are going to have to put moratoriums. There's going to have to be water restrictions in ways that are incredibly uncomfortable for people who are used to just like ransacking the earth, right? Native people are gonna be fine because we've been screwed <laughs> since the very beginning. I was gonna, we don't even use that much water. I was gonna say, I don't think, like, <laughs> I drink a lot of water, okay? That's, you know, maybe a gallon a day, probably. Um, I drink a lot of water, I do shower and I wash my legs. So that makes for a longer shower because we know white settlers do not wash their legs. <laughs> um, you use an extra gallon of water to wash right. your legs. That's that's an appropriate usage of water. That's right. 
Um, I do not have a swimming pool. I do not have a lawn. I have um, uh, flower beds with, uh, what do they call it, Zurich landscaping. So stuff that just lives from what comes from the sky. And we grow food to eat for our family, not for huge amounts of people. So like water restrictions is how I live my life. I grew up in a desert. We never wasted water. No. You know, when I was a kid before, cause in, in ver when I was very young, we didn't have indoor plumbing at Okay Wing Gay. And so we, when we would go up to stay with relatives up there, there was nine kids and my aunt and my mom would pull out the wheelbarrow and they would heat water on the, the wood stove and fill up the wheelbarrow. And that's how we bathed in the, in the cold weather. And then in the warm weather, we'd go down to the river and with a bar of ivory soap. And I still remember how it smells. The, the, we never used a lot of water because we were raised with a respect for water and you don't, you don't waste anything in indigenous um, communities. You just don't, it's, it's, it's not the way we live, but water in particular. So like what Melanie said, I mean, yeah, indigenous communities are going to be okay. Like we don't generally have lawns and if we're, if we're using water for irrigation or something, we're growing food. And the idea of swimming pools in Phoenix, along with the already mentioned um, golf courses, is just appalling to me. It's appalling to me that people in their own houses, not communities, but individual houses all have swimming pools. And what an incredible waste of water that is. And those are, that's what's gonna hurt is all of these people with their lawns and their swimming pools and um, their you know incredible uh, landscaping that they pay for um, to have the gardener come in, but they don't really have water. Everything has to be watered. It doesn't come from the sky. You know, those are the people that are going to be hurt by water restrictions, but it's, it's that or not have anything to drink. I mean, we're, we've been talking about drought in New Mexico for a long, long time. And, you know, they, they talk about a mega drought and here we just say perpetual drought. Like we're, we're in perpetual drought. Yeah. I mean, there's, you know, there are, there are a lot of stories um, that have been emerging over the last few years from indigenous farmers. When I say indigenous farmers, I mean people who've been like practicing traditions of indigenous farming in the arid region of the Southwest for millennia, using seeds that date back thousands of years that are accustomed and adapted um, to the lack of water, corn, right? Corn, squash, and that those, those food, they're not just food, sometimes they feed us, but they're used for ceremonies, right? It's, there's liter they're, they're quite literally at the center of who we are and our relationship with the land and the water. And even those little tiny small scale farms where you have just one field of corn, one field of melons, for example, even those, um, there are many multiple reports from indigenous farmers who are very practice in dry farming techniques that have been developed through indigenous knowledge systems over the millennia. They're like, even using those techniques, we're seeing that a lot of our crop is not surviving. It's not growing. It's not right. Climate change, the, the, the level of drought is unprecedented, I think, in like recorded human history um, and certainly since the establishment of the United States. And so this is what we're facing right now. It's unprecedented, actually. And so there's that kind of context in relationship to just indigenous ways of life and water. I also wanted to make a comment about two other things, like a, kind of a non sequitur, but that you, what you were talking, Elaine, it made me think, you know, what I just described um, around the Colorado River, like the Colorado River truly is like a microcosm. It's really like a very prime example of the history of settler colonialism and like imperial capitalism in in Turtle Island, um, specifically the way that the United States has practiced this. It really shows you how that has unfolded and what those relations of inequality and underdevelopment 
have really looked like. Um, the Navajo Nation, I think, being a very good example of that in this regard, and that places like the Navajo Nation are in a permanent state of underdevelopment, right? A lack of water infrastructure because our the our wealth and our path towards being able to farm our crops and the way that I just described, or even just being able to like wash our hands so that so many of our relatives don't didn't die from COVID-19, that that has been denied, systematically denied by this outside system that hyper exploits and hyper extracts from us. And so that is the larger picture, I would say, of settler colonialism and the way that capitalism has operated as a modality or like a type of settler colonialism um, vis-a-vis native nations and native people historically here in the United States. But justice, right? Decolonization isn't just about like undoing the systems of harm of the present and the past that have been genocidal, right? That have committed these harms and killed so many of our people, so much of our relatives, not just human beings, but other relatives. But decolonization requires justice, right? It requires a kind of reparations for the harm caused. And really, I mean, if you're really gonna be honest about where we're at in that region, um, there's no justice. Like native people and native nations are simply going to have to swallow the injustice because the justice would look like water and there's no water. It, there's no money and there's no water. There's no way for, there's no path towards restitution for what has happened. And so it's like, yes, native people and native nations will survive. Like we always survive this crisis, this unprecedented crisis of drought. We absolutely will. Cause we don't even use any goddamn water <laughs> compared to these other entities, but there's never going to be justice for what has already happened and what continues to happen. And I don't know what that means <laughs> in terms of decolonization and moving forward. All I know is that this is the reality that we're facing and we just have to move forward. And I have a very strong feeling too, that it will have to be indigenous people and like indigenous knowledge that's gonna like save non-native people, even though they have committed egregious crimes against native people. And then it's like, so then what do you do with that? It's like, we have to save your ass even though you stole our future from us. Cool story, <laughs> you know? And so this is like, I think this is what native people confront right now. That said, I don't know how many people are employed doing the industrial agriculture in California and Arizona most of those are migrant laborers, okay? These are all, this is also a community and a population that faces extreme racism vis-a-vis -vis their working conditions, um, being constantly called illegals, right? Being confronted by the racist regime um, around immigration in the United States. They have no rights. They have no, a lot of them don't have citizenship. They're invisibilized and they're highly expendable and hyper exploited. And so, Closing down the operations because there's no water also makes it so that these people have no jobs. They have no income to support their entire families, right? Their entire families across Turtle Island, wherever that they might be. And so the calls for just transition, right? Just transition is like, how do we address the impact of climate change without, you know, all of these people just losing their jobs in this transition from dirty energy to clean energy? I don't really know what that looks like. Cause I don't, there's no like water reclamation to be had cause there's no water. Land can be cleaned. I think the land, land that has been polluted, it's not like the land is going away. Sometimes it just needs to be cleaned. And so sometimes workers who let's say who are working in a coal power plant, they can then be transitioned to jobs where they're reclaiming the land and cleaning up the land from contamination, right? Just transition model right there. But with water, there's no water. You can't just like create water out of nowhere that can then be cleaned because there just isn't enough of it. It's a, it's a finite resource, <laughs> water is finite. And so where would these people work, right? When, when this stuff, when these operations have to shut down. And I don't even know who eats that food. 
If that's a major food supply for the world, what happens when that food is no longer being grown and people are going hungry who rely upon the food that's grown through the hyper exploitation of labor, land, and water in places like California and Arizona? And of course, this is all related to climate change. But all I'm saying is that, like, it's bad. It's going to get worse. And there's a weird kind of like head stuck in the mud kind of approach, but also a total refusal. This is what I was going to say about the COVID-19 example. People were willing to give a shit about other people for a very short period of time to prevent the spread of COVID-19 and to prevent deaths. But that didn't last very long, right? We've no, it lasted what, a year, about a year, about a year, year and a half, maybe. And people were like, fuck it. Not only people, but corporations basically were demanding a reopening of everything because they wanted money. They wanted an influx of money again to make profits. And so some of these entities might, you know, decide, I mean, entities meaning parties to the Colorado River, especially the wealthy ones, they may decide like to be like, okay, well, sure, we'll do this. For the out of the kindness, it won't be out of the kindness of their hearts, but they'll be like, sure, we'll stop using so much water so people don't die <laughs> because of the drought. But that ain't, unless you force them to stop doing it, they ain't gonna stop doing it. That they're always just gonna ransack and then they'll just go somewhere else because capitalism just finds new horizons for exploitation and profit. And so that's just what's happening in this region. And I don't really see that, I don't really see like the ethics of care that come out of an indigenous values-based system. That's why indigenous nations have actually, I argue, been the model for how to handle the COVID-19 pandemic. There's still a mask mandate in the Navajo Nation. Like you can't even still have public gatherings in some cases in the Navajo Nation. And honestly, that shit will probably be permanent because the pandemic from what we can tell is not going away. It's just gonna keep morphing with the new strains. Or like Pine Ridge Indian Reservation closing its borders for people and being very stringent, right? About who they were letting in and out. And it's because of that indigenous ethics of care. We actually care about the future. Our lives don't belong to us. Our lives belong to future generations. And this is how we govern ourselves according to those values. And like, this is why we care about COVID-19. It's because we care about a future that we aren't even gonna be around to see, but we want that future to be beautiful, not just for us, but for everyone. And I think that that same approach to water is what's gonna get us through. But also like, this is why I think indigenous approaches to water are also the model for how to make it through the drought even if we have to do it in islands alone, you know, even if we continue to face such intense racism and theft and just genocide, like that's what's happening through this water. And we're gonna continue to assist working class people, migrant communities, and other people who are also hyper exploited in our lands. Cause that's who we are. We actually care about people. <laughs> <laughs> and, we care, and we care about water, too. Water is a relative. So water is not just drinking water and washing water. Um, but these rivers and these byways um, and these tributaries, these are our relatives. And the water contained within the rivers is a relative. And, and you know, indigenous people, um, like, I don't know how many of you... Uh, Back in the day, I read Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which was considered this benchmark book about water and um, and about, well, it was about birds, but it was also about water. And uh, I remember having a conversation with my dad about it. And there were some things in that book which were beautifully written. And, um, you know, one of the things that she talks about is that every water every water source on earth is connected because 
water evaporates, it goes up into the clouds, clouds move, and then it rains and it comes down someplace else. And I remember saying to my dad, this is something that our people have talked about <laughs> for generations, like the, the relationship that we have with water and the relationship we have with clouds and the prayers to the thunder beings. And I don't know how it is in, in Diné, but, but the, the water, um, the water maidens and the water youths that we pray to on the mountains, literally every ceremony, we're praying to the mountains, to to the water youths and the water maidens to send the, the thunder beings, to send the clouds. And we know that they go and visit other places and we're, we're calling them back. So this relationship that we have with water is, is one that is, you know, that, that, that goes back to, to the beginning of time. And so when you were talking, Melanie, about like indigenous stewardship, like that's how we treat water as our relative and respect water. And, and that's the only way we're going to get through this. Like water is not meant to be used for swimming pools and golf courses. Water is meant to sustain life. And it's not just our life, like the trees, the animals, the fish, the birds, we all depend on the same water. And every single being depends on the next being that depends on the next being. And we have this whole, you know, not to be all Elton John here, but this whole circle of life that that is sustained by water. And if we don't respect the water um, and listen to the water, then, you know, it, it, water is life. Mini Wachoni, water is life. Like we will not have life. Life is unsustainable without water. So indigenous stewardship is so important. And, you know, I, I do think that just like fire management or forest management, our people have the answers and it's just time for settlers to listen, to stop talking. Shut the fuck up and listen. And like, listen, but also like, we should be enforcing things as indigenous nations, you know? Like not just for our own population, but for the populations. Cause it's like, y'all need to follow our advice. Cause we do actually know what we're doing. There are a lot of tribal governments who don't know what they're doing, but there are a lot of indigenous people who are experts <laughs> who know what they're doing and we should be listening and doing what they tell us to do. Honestly, we should just be doing what they tell us to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you do with elders in our communities. You do what they tell you to do because they have a lot of knowledge. And it's not a coincidence that just in the last decade, 2016, you know, Standing Rock, the No Dapo movement, that I've said this before in other forums, water is what brought us back together. Water reminded us of our humanity as five-fingered beings. We didn't do that for ourselves in that moment. It was water. It was our water relatives that brought us back together, together and gave us strength. That has not ended and we need to build upon that. And there's a reason why that is happening in this particular moment. It is all about water. It's all about water. It's all about life. And it's all about the future. Those are three really basic things that indigenous movements represent right now. Not our tribal governments necessarily, but indigenous movements. Mm -hmm. And those are three things that we must continue to carry forward in every single aspect of our lives, but also our organizing work. It's just, it's actually very basic. It's not even elevated political <laughs> like analysis of things. I actually don't even need to go into like in a Marxist analysis of class necessarily or like settler colonialism and capitalism. I think indigenous movements actually in the last decade have told us these are the things we can rally around that we need to. And in fact, water, life and futurity are at the center of um, climate justice struggles as well. If like the Buen Vivir movement out of, you know, Bolivia and those types of places. And so that's uh, that's where we're at. 
I think that's where we're at. I also am on a high horse about this because I speak as somebody who grew up hauling water. <laughs> My dad actually hauled a lot of the water, but we had to help him haul water because our well dried up when I was like a teenager. I've taken baths in buckets. I've taken other things in buckets, uh -huh. the toilet, <laughs> buckets, not TMIing, but like even where we are building our um, home sites, our home sites in the Navajo Nation are on top of a mesa in the chapter where uh, my family is from and there's no running water up there and there never will be. So we'll continue to haul water in our traditional homelands as well. And so yeah, hauling water and not having water is something I'm keenly familiar with. Um, and outhouses and one of my clans are beautiful. Is a water clan. Outhouses are great. Can, I mean, <laughs> I I have... I, I, Your ass does get cold in the winter it time. It does, and you gotta That's watch out for thing. the uh, black winters. But like, yeah. I, I love to see, uh, and I spent a lot of time um, on the Hopi mesas when I was growing up as a kid. And I love to see the outhouses like hanging over the mesas. So you had to be really careful when you were going out there at night. But then I like the little windows, like people carved in stars and little crescent moons on the doors of the outhouse. So when you were sitting there, you could actually look out and see the stars. I mean, it, you know, these are, this is the way that we grew up and running water and indoor plumbing, you know, still to me is a luxury. It still feels like a luxury. 40, 50 years later, like we've had it for most of my older childhood and my entire life. But those, those times that I remember getting up and going to the outhouses and bathing in the wheelbarrows and bathing in the river with all of your cousins, you know, like those are great memories, and um, and I still think indoor plumbing and you know toilets and all that is a luxury, and it's one that we need to to be you know be careful. Well, oh my gosh, I've been recording for almost an hour. I talked so much. I I'm not going to apologize for talking a lot because I had a lot to say, but also I feel like I took up a huge amount of time. <laughs> budget of this episode because we have our things we want to talk about right there's talking about like uh the systematic and planned underdevelopment of indigenous communities right like being in a constant state of underdevelopment like lack of water infrastructure for example um because all of the the wealth is siphoned out of our communities and put into you know development for settlers especially the ruling class a similar argument I think can be made of black communities in places like Chicago and Jackson and Flint. Um, there are recent, of course, I, I'm sure people who are listening to this are aware of the water crisis unfolding in Jackson, Mississippi, which has uh, 80, upwards of 80%, 80 to 90% of the population is black in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, a report just came out from The Guardian last week, I believe it was, uh, about the, it, the toxic levels of lead that are in um, the municipal or like the public water supply for primarily Hispano and uh, black communities in certain neighborhoods in Chicago as well. Um, and actually I found out from reading an infographic, um, I think it's from an organization called Black Youth Project on Instagram, that there was a lawsuit filed. I'm trying to, I actually need to look this up, a lawsuit filed on behalf of 600 children um, in Jackson prior to the, the crisis that has been unfolding over the last month and a half there, um, where toxic levels of lead were also found in the drinking supply in black neighborhoods in, in the city of Jackson, Mississippi. And so folks are saying, right, that this is a clear example of environmental racism. And one of the ways, right, that environmental racism works is to keep certain communities, um, racialized communities, it can be indigenous nations, right? They can be majority black cities or majority black neighborhoods in a state of chronic underdevelopment, right? Um, so that those are the communities that face the brunt of whether it's pollution or they face the brunt of like lack of infrastructure or crumbling infrastructure or like a lack of development. And not to say that they're the same situation, but in my mind, I've been thinking about this and that water, right? Whether it's, it's access to water, which means so many different things, um, as Elena was just describing, it's cultural, it's political, it's about survival. Um, it's not just about human beings, it's an entire ecology of life depends upon water. Water is a primary way, I say, which the US settler state 
and then also capitalism continues um, in a very racist manner, right? Continues to deploy racism and inequality in order to keep itself afloat, to make its profits and to build its power. And that this is happening in many communities, but I think in my mind, the starkest right now are like indigenous and black communities. Yeah, the I was reading that an article um, from the AP about Jackson and this th this just so they lifted the boil water advisory on Thursday, um, but lead in some of the pipes remains so worrisome that pregnant women and young children should still use bottled water. And there's a quote from a woman in Jackson who says, "The water that's coming out of my kitchen stink still smells like fresh sewage." As soon as you turn it on, it hits you right in the face. It's horrible. I tried to give one of my dogs the water, but when she smells it, she won't even touch it. She walks away. I mean, can you imagine the city of Jackson saying that it's okay for human beings to not boil their water, unless you're pregnant or really young, but it's okay for the rest of you, but the dogs won't even touch it. I mean... It's just, um, you talk about like, what does justice look like there? I mean, that's a question, right? For the folks of Jackson to answer. And I think the black led liberation movement more broadly to answer. And then our responsibility as indigenous folks is like, how can we be in solidarity with that? I wanna say something really quickly. Cooperation Jackson, uh, which is a really prominent um, black radical organizing organ organization um, has issued a call for support. And I believe uh, they gave 10 to 12 things that you can do to contribute to help with the water crisis in Jackson. We're gonna let's share the link um, in the distribution of this episode. But look up Cooperation Jackson. Uh, let me let me find. I'll say the link real quickly here. Cooperationjackson.org um, backslash donate um, if you're interested. And if you're interested in learning more, like I said, Black Youth Project on Instagram has about a 10 slide um, Instagram story that gives like very very good but very detailed information um, about the water crisis. 82.5 percent of the population in Jackson is Black. And I wanted to read this from one of the slides from the Black Youth Project um, Instagram account that the roots of environmental racism in Jackson, which is roughly 82.5% black, can be traced to divestment in the city as a result of the civil rights movement. This shift in the 1960s that resulted in white flight uh, due to the integration of public schools and other public facilities. This divestment and anti-black sentiment are consistent with the issues found in Flint and other majority black communities. Uh, and divestment, that divestment piece, uh, right, that's also part of this kind of larger structure of inequality between development and underdevelopment I was talking about in the context of the Navajo Nation, where, right, you're basically holding investment hostage, i.e. the millions of dollars that are needed for infrastructure projects, um, which, by the way, the mayor of Jackson has been asking for for years <laughs> from the state and the federal government and knew that something like this was going to happen, but nobody did anything. No one gave. There was there was no allocation and no desire to fund the overhaul of, of the water delivery system in Jackson to prevent this from happening. And so the same case is true, right, in a place like the Navajo Nation, where we aren't even able to just put in those that type of infrastructure because it's being held hostage through the settlement process. And so it's basically strong arming indigenous nations to settle our water rights, like severely diminished water rights um, in order to receive that money. And so it's a, it's, a, it's a similar type of divestment or a refusal to invest in communities, um, particularly racialized communities like in indigenous and black communities and so it's not a coincidence, right, that these types of things happen in those communities. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. Yes, also that clean water is a basic human right. <laughs> yeah. And that, you know, that honestly, nobody can own water. I mean, water comes from the sky. Water comes from 
the rivers and the and the seas and the like how can you own water how can you even conceive of of owning something that is essential to human life uh, that would that's like that would be like owning the sunshine um you know that plants require for photosynthesis it's the same thing just that water may be more tangible and can be manipulated but it literally is the same thing how can you own something that is so essential for human life i just don't understand that i mean there's this whole thing right if you look in the history of water adjudication in the southwest which of course i'm most familiar with water just gets turned into property like everything else in a capitalist system water becomes property and the only way you can settle water is through quantifying your if they're called acre feet water is measured by acre feet and so you have to quantify the amount of acre feet per year that you're allowed to have and it's based on use like a lot of the dispossession of land historically in the united states was like a total fabrication of manifest destiny essentially where it's like well these these indians these savages weren't using the land they weren't being they weren't usefully using the land and so then we had to come in and we we got to claim the land and privatize it you know and claim it as our own as a property because we were actually using the land you know these indians were just wandering around on top of it essentially that's another crass depiction but that's pretty much what manifest destiny says as a justification for conquest and illegal seizure of land the same logic applies to water where it's like um at least in arizona for example there was a completely fabricated notion that water should be adjudicated according to who's using it usefully and it's like of course like native people within like the racial economy of settler colonialism aren't going to be deemed as using anything usefully because we're not civilized <laughs> according to that logic so it's like we're incapable of using anything usefully because apparently we have no civilization or technology right and so these are the same logics that apply to water and even there's the notion of quantifying water and like measuring it is such anathema to i think an indigenous philosophy and indigenous values-based approach to water which like you said elaine it's like no one can own water but they do <laughs> water is heavily water's a property right like anything else it is and in and, 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 and in new mexico um, it's the use it or lose it. So if you don't, and like Melanie said, if you don't use your acre, however many acre feet of water you're entitled to per year to grow your corn or your chili in your fields, like this year, we had a tremendous amount of rain um, towards the end of the of the uh, growing season. Well, we're still in the end of the growing season, but we've had a tremendous amount of rain. So farmers haven't been irrigating as much as they're entitled to. So if this were to happen year year over year, they would actually lose those water rights because they're not using, they're not actually irrigating as much as they're entitled to. Which to me is like, uh, that's good. They're not irrigating because water's falling from the sky. So why are you punishing them? I mean, it makes no sense. Yeah, I mean... There's such like a design to prevent certain people and communities and forms like relatives or forms of life from having any type of survival or future. But at the same time, there's also like, like you said, it's a house of cards. There's, it makes no sense. It makes perfect sense and no sense at the same time, which is basically just a description of the United States, but from an indigenous perspective. But the question, like, what does justice look like? I just said earlier, like, there can't be any justice for what has already transpired in relationship to like the theft and the dispossession um, through water with indigenous nations. Is that the same for other communities that have confronted, you know, their own kinds of environmental racism through water? I don't know. All I know is that like, we're being confronted with a very real, like water's tangible, <laughs> like a very real thing. And maybe the best thing that we can do is survive, <laughs> survive, keep the cultural practices and the spiritual and the ceremonial practices related to water going in whatever way is appropriate for us as indigenous people. And 
trying to help others to, to, to activate, right, that ethics of care, to help others who have been similarly exploited and um, subject to this kind of state-sponsored violence, um, help them survive as well, because they are, they're on and in an indigenous land, right? And we have an ethics of taking care of people, and that's the best we can do, I think, um, in in the foreseeable future. I don't, I don't. Maybe that's maybe I'm being pessimistic. Maybe we can have a revolution and <laughs> like things can change. But even I don't know. Even that won't change the fact that there just isn't enough water. <laughs> People do often say it's not that there aren't enough resources. It's just that the resources are hoarded by like the the very few, right? And that is true. I think in terms of certain things, I'm not sure that's true in terms of water. It's true in terms of money, and housing, and those types of things. But I'm not sure that's true in terms of water or even food. So, just my thoughts. Uh. Wow. We, we, do you want to pivot to talking about um, Alaska here at the kind of to conclude the episode? Why sure. Not? I um, well, well, we're facing drought, extreme drought, and and water crises here in the Southwest. Um, Alaska was hit by a typhoon last week, and the the water surge was so. Um, enormous, you know, low-lying communities were were just ravaged by thirty-foot um, thirty-foot waves, and um, people had to take refuge inland. The typhoon was called Murbach. I don't know what that means exactly. If it is um, an indigenous word, um, but yeah, Mur typhoon Murbach. And high winds, storm surges, erosion, erosion, flooding, um, and this this was extremely like as a as a a mental image for me. More than a thousand miles of coastline was impacted by this typhoon, which was about the same distance as from Nebraska to San Francisco. So that's the number of of miles of coastline in these um, in these. Um, areas in Alaska. And um, Hooper Bay's tribal chief, um, Edgar Tall Jr., um, says he's never experienced anything like this storm in his whole life. So climate change is, you know, impacting the Southwest with these mega droughts or what we call perpetual droughts. And yet in other areas across Turtle Island, um, you're having these these unbelievable water events, um, typhoons, and and then you know Dominican Republic, uh, Puerto Rico. Well, hit Puerto Rico first. Um, this was Fiona, Hurricane Fiona, hit Puerto Rico, devastated poor Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico has been devastated like every single year, and you know prayers up to our ancestors and and relatives. In, in Puerto Rico and, and Dominican Republic and, um, and Haiti, because the, these storms have just devastated these areas, and particularly in Puerto Rico, where, where um, Puerto Rico is literally a colony of the United States, and the United States has done nothing to, to help, help them. But so these enormous water events, these catastrophic water events are happening. Um, due to climate change. And there's literally nothing that we can do. I mean, you, you know, go back to this, what does justice look like? That There is no justice because first of all, it's stolen land. And second of all, it's climate change caused by capitalism and imperialism that has so damaged the natural order of things that these events are inevitable right now. Um, People are, and then ironically, people in Puerto Rico are without water because their water has been, been their water system, delivery systems have been destroyed. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, our, um, one of our Red Nation comrades, Maida, lives in Mexico City, I believe. And Maida said that there's this saying, because um, there was a historic earthquake also in in uh, Mexico. I forgot which uh, which region uh, just a few days ago, right? It's like the second or third. In the same place where it hit the exact, exact same time. Second or third one on that same date every year. That's okay. First of all, that's yeah. wild. Well, or maybe I just don't know how. Is it? Uh, what's the science of earthquake seismology? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a fault line. I don't know how that it's works. It's a fault line, but but the fact that they're happening on the same date is pretty eerie. That seems yoded. Yeah. That seems yoded to me, just as an indigenous person. I'm just like reading, just reading the messages. Yeah. But she, right, in re reference to that, but also she was just saying, like, the kind, the, what do they call it? Like, the compound injustice and then also just, like, the material reality of, like, what's happening because of climate change. That there's a saying um, in Mexico, it's just rain on top of water. Mm -hmm. And what's happening in Puerto Rico reminds me of the same thing. It's like... It's just rain on top of water. And it's like, but you haven't gotten rid of the water from the last time the rain devastate. You get what I'm saying? And so there's just like, it's just like layer of water on top of water on top of water on top of water, which is like obviously a completely different, if you're thinking metaphorically, that's a completely different image than like in the Southwest, which is like, it's like development on top of development without any water. But anyway, we don't need to be speaking in metaphors, but I think it just helps to understand like, how do you navigate, like, such a complex historical and material terrain when it comes to this? When, you know, in terms of, like, the question of justice or even just livability, if we're organizing, right, if we believe in, I don't know, liberation, I feel like I'm in this place where I'm not entirely sure what liberation looks like <laughs> because of the rain on top of water that we're facing. Um, but that's just me. I don't think necessarily other people have to be in this place, but I, it's kind of on my mind every day. And it's probably because I think a lot about water and I think through water. My um, One of my colleagues, Kutcha Risling Baldi, who um, I co-authored a special issue on water with for the Decolonization Journal. She said something about thinking like water Right. So it's not water's a resource. It's not like I think about water. It's like, how do we think like water? How does water think? And then how does water teach us how to conduct ourselves? Right. Because water is a relative and water is a leader. Just like what happened at Standing Rock, water led us to a certain place where we reignited our courage and our strength and our passion to continue the fight for liberation. And so every day I'm like trying to think like water and I'm like, how how will we go about you know, this project and the struggle for liberation, if we're thinking like water, because I think that that's one of the things that we need to be doing um, today and then many years into the future is thinking like water. Yeah, I agree. I think and water whispers, you know, water, water whispers, water sings, water. doesn't ever shriek like the thunder beings shriek and pound, but water, water just whispers and sings. So maybe we need to just, like we were talking about earlier, maybe we just need to, to really listen carefully and listen to our ancestors, listen to our elders, um, listen to just what the land is, is telling us and the trees in particular, like when we talked about this at an earlier episode, but walking among the really tall trees in the old growth forests um, on Northern Vancouver Island. And I can hear them talking to one another and, and whispering and, um, and I wonder like, first of all, I'm so grateful to have been there and seen these trees and I told them so. And 
there was one point where I was standing there and just this ray of sun came right down through the branch of the tree and I'm standing there. And it, it was like, I felt like I was being beamed up. And I just was so grateful to, to be there and to be among these old, old beings. And, you know, we, we spend so much of our life rushing around and being busy and, um, and wondering, you know, what the future is going to bring. I think it is scary and the, 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 the things that are happening are scary, but I think if we stopped every now and then and just listen to the trees and listen to the water, we might get some answers that, um, that we just need to keep being, right? We're human beings, we're not human doings. And maybe we're trying to do things when we should just be. And maybe that's what the future of liberation is, is just being who we are and supporting all of our relatives to be who they are and amplifying the voices of those who have the wisdom that we need to hear. Well, I think that's a good place to end it. This was good. I haven't had a hardcore conversation about water in a long time, like years, maybe, even though it's always on my mind. Um, I know that, for example, Red Nation wanted to hold what will actually, uh, if we can organize it, <laughs> our next Native Liberation I'm not putting any pressure on the Red Nation because, you know, we're operating at limited capacity still. But uh, Native Liberation, which used to be Native Liberation Conference, if people don't know, was something that we held every year starting in 2016. And it was growing and growing and growing. 2019 was our largest and most successful conference yet. And then the pandemic hit. And we haven't had a Native Liberation in three years, right, since the fall of 2019. So we're in conversations right now about, like, having a new one. Um, probably in the spring of 2023 and we pretty much universally in the organization we're like so what should we maybe should there be a theme like is there something we should concentrate on and we're like water <laughs> it should be water uh, so hopefully hopefully um, over the coming months we're able to organize something like that into existence but I'm just happy to be I don't know to have water teaching us how to move forward in the, the struggle for the future um, what you said, just being, but also teaching us how, how to go about the struggle for liberation. Um, cause I think that will continue to be true, uh, for many, many years ahead. And it's important for Red Nation, you know, that advocates for indigenous liberation to be thinking about that and solidarity and prayers go out to everyone, um, in Jackson and anywhere else in Puerto Rico, uh, and in Alaska and all of indigenous people who are facing the drought and trying to figure out how to survive through it. Um, yep. So we should do another episode on water sometime in a few months to see what has developed. But thanks for joining us, everyone. Just a reminder, if you're not a Patreon subscriber, please join. Um, you can look up Red Media under patreon.com. Uh, I don't say this very often, but you could consider increasing <laughs> your Patreon membership. Uh, I know that Red Media right now is trying to grow um, you know, we're just trying to, I don't know, do more stuff. We're just trying to do more things, positive things for our people. And in order to do that, we need resources in order to be able to do that. And so Patreon really is a huge part um, of that contribution. And so if you or anyone you know can join or increase your subscription, that would be wonderful. We'd really appreciate it. And yeah, we're going to be back in two weeks doing a main feed episode on Dark Winds, which is that dumb Tony Hillerman book <laughs> that has turned into a TV show. Uh, that won't be as somber. And we'll probably just be trashing it a lot. We're going to try to bring on a guest um, for that show. And then we'll also be creating bonus content about Dark Winds. So you have that to look forward to. And then maybe we'll be doing another newsy show after that. And then, drum roll, I think we're going to be doing a breakdown of season two of Reservation Dogs sometime in October. Yes. Yes. We're both looking forward to that. We talk about it constantly. So there's, I, I don't know, it's going to have to be like a two-part episode. I'm not really sure, but we have so much to say. But anyway, that's what you have to look forward to on Red Power Hour. Thanks again, everyone, for listening. Until next time.